All right, we're going to go ahead and start. All right. So how many people looked at the video that I sent out the other day? All right, couple, couple, couple. Was it helpful? Okay. So what I'll continue to do is I'll continue to send out those type of items. Plus, when you look at the syllabus, there is a there's a spreadsheet. There's a spreadsheet in the PDF. That spreadsheet lists out videos and resources for every single assignment. Right. Like I said, if you don't like listening to my voice, I, I always thought I had a, you know, shaft deep voice. I don't. But you can go through that spreadsheet and then that spreadsheet will give you additional resources. You know, when we cover cryptography and especially when you work on your projects, I say, like, all right, well, how do you do X, Y and Z? It will be a link to a video and other resources you can actually go and follow with that. We're still working the um, TAs, but there will be. Um, Two TAs for the class. So I will share that once everything is finalized. In the meantime, we're going to finish this up and you're going to work on the particular assignment together. What we covered earlier this week. What do we remember about what we covered? What were some of the key things? Okay, CIA. So, so somebody tell me what confidentiality is. Uh, confidentiality specifically is regarding the ability for me to say access or no, access, uh, say uh, keep my inf information private to only those who should have access permissions for it, not say to any other party or so that. Okay. So confidentiality, that term comes from what organization? Not NIST. Uh, no, no. What organization? What organization? Create the concept of confidentiality, security tax. Government. The government, the military, right? You now, this is classified. You can't view it. Oh, I need to view it. No, it's confidential. That's where it came from. Availability. Somebody tell me what availability is. Making sure that the information is available all the time. Let's say if I'm uh, somewhere and I need to access the information right now at 12 o'clock in the afternoon or at night. It should be available 24 7 whenever if i have the correct access uh, so it should be available to me. okay now availability will change depending upon the mission of the organization if you're a bank you need to be available all the time right yeah. your stock exchange you can't afford to not be available right but some organizations availability is, is not that important right you don't need to have availability all the time all right the last one integrity in the back oh there we go integrity Integrity is uh, when, uh, some, only some people can change the file and those who don't have access. Okay, that's an example. Someone else give me another example. Yes. So making sure the file is protected. So there's, if there's a token on link for say, if you send it to me, you need something that I can say to them, and it's not a danger. Like, that's possible to say to them. It's having trust that what you're clicking is safe. Yeah, that's correct. These are those are both correct. So when you have a particular item, you're saying that I can trust that this is what it should be. All right. Everybody drove here today, right? Oh, bus. What did you say? Train? I just walked over. You just walked. Okay. Same. You just, okay. I've just been ill these past couple of days, so it's been rough. <laughs> <laughs> who took the who took the train? Anybody take the train? Okay. All right. We drove, but we drove with Google Maps or something. All right, so let's just use that example, right? So your maps, your your use maps, you're a, you're saying that okay, I trust that this is the actual direction. It's not going to lead me to a bad neighborhood. You know, this is going to take me to thirty third and state, right? So that would be an example of integrity. Like the directions are what they should be. What's interesting. Certain nefarious actors have changed like flight plans for drones and stuff like that. And also um, um, those items that are on the, the, the sea, the collide and stuff, because they change the actual plan. So individuals operate that, oh, this is okay. I'm, I'm looking at the plan. This is what it should be. And they end up colliding with another um, vehicle or vessel, right? All because there was really no integrity in the actual directions or the, uh, the maps or whatnot. All right, so we're just going to cover this a bit, and then we're going to jump into the assignment just to give a little bit more detail. So this is an access control matrix. Remember, a subject request 
particular object to do something. And so here, this is just a matrix, right? So what you see here is you have the subject and you have the object. All this does is say that these are the subjects and these are the objects and what subject one can do with a with objects A through G. Subject one can, you know, can work, deal with, can access object A and E, and that's all this is, right? This right here, um, I don't think it's a very productive way of doing something like that, yes. Oh, yes, I was gonna ask Dr. Mo, um, would there be a way for us to say, create groups of access levels via this matrix to say, people who maybe need access to certain things, but they're all grouped together. So in the yeah, so you could, right? There's, you have role-based access controls, which access controls are based off a role. You're a sysadmin, you're a programmer, you get access controls based off this. The problem is you also have different projects that you're working on. So you need to access that information. So you have role-based and then you have something called rule-based. And based upon that rule, and that rule can be like, you need access to whatever, directories or folders, then you can access that. So now you have those two particular access control rules placed. Then you can say based off security clearance, right? So now you have MAC, mandatory access controls. And so now based off clearance, there's an additional item that's set. A lot of times the organization, it works just like that. And then you have discretion. It's like, hey, you know, I own the organization. I own the data. Just access it. I just say, go do it. But when you're doing with like uh, government or a lot of these heavy, heavily regulated industries, you will have um, some form of mandatory access control based off a clearance that you've obtained. But it gets very complicated. But um, for you to just create something yourself, um, that would be kind of like discretionary, but you wanna make your job easy, right? You don't wanna work too hard. You just don't. Because you're gonna have many more things. That's gonna be like one small part of a particular job or function you have to do. So if you have rules set up, it makes it a whole lot easier. It's like, all right, uh, this guy got hired, boom. This is the clearance he has, the project he's doing, his role. Based on these items, this is what he has access to automatically. And if there's something else that he needs access to, you can say, all right, now I'm going to use discretionary to add in other things that they need access. Maybe he's consulting for another project, boom. Going to add in for like two weeks, more than enough for him to get that job done. One of the easiest ways to do something like that, you generally get something called charge numbers. And charge numbers are for the account that you're working on. You're working on, I use aerospace and defense because that's where I come from. Um, if you worked on this uh, weapon system, weapon system A has this charge code, weapon system B has this charge code. So as long as you're charging to weapon system A and B, you're able to see these items. But as soon as you stop using that charge code, then the access is removed from that particular system. And that's how it works. All right, this is another one here, actually. Okay, I'll just go right here. All right, so these are the um, typical access permission. Here is showing all types of access denied. The key thing is read equals four, write equals two, x equals one, all right? Do I have anything? I don't have anything here. Oh, actually, I did. Let me grab something. Let's see, which one of these are actually good? That's bad. That again. That again. Okay, wow. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> perhaps I'm gonna have to bring in my own, but oh, yeah, I got you. Oh, you got you got me. Oh, thank okay. you. I was studying, I was doing some physics earlier. I right, appreciate that. I'll take any color. All right. All right, so you look here, you have one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, read, write, execute, read, write, execute, read, write, execute. Users, groups, others, right? So you just add these items up and this will tell you the permissions of your file, right? So if I say I want them to have read, write, execute, they have seven. They just need execute one. Uh, just write two. So now that file will be 712 would be the file, the number that's associated with it. You can always change it. Now, I do get lazy sometimes. Okay, a lot of times. Uh, I would do change modify plus X in the, the file, and it will just give execute to everything. So you can do stuff like that. I'll show you those shortcuts. But this right here is all this is, right? And this is key because this will 
this is how you write your executable um, program, right? When you install, you can use Vim for this assignment or you can use Nano. I use Vim, just an all-time favorite, but you can use Nano. There's hundreds of text editors, but those are like the two popular ones. All right, so this one is the Harrison Russo Ullman table. So it just shows here, like Joe Zier for program A, he can read and execute. He can he can uh, write, right? So he can read it. He can execute. It means that he can read the file. He can execute it. Read execute in this particular database, and then these files. He has the ability to read, write, execute. You can see, like even for process, they're all different. All right. So what I'm going to do now is show this particular. There's these are like two key models: the Biba and the Bellapodule security model. If you look at the Bill of Podule model, it's the confidentiality policy. Simple security property, subject cannot read an object of higher sensitivity. The star property, subject cannot write to an object of lower sensitivity. And then you have strong star property, subject cannot read write to an object of higher, lower sensitivity. So here you can see confidential, secret, top secret. Alfred, the subject here, you look right here, all right? You can see what they can do. They cannot read. This is just read right here, right? So they, they can read at their sensitivity and they can read lower, but they can't read higher. Why do you think the simple security property doesn't allow Alfred to read higher? Yes. Oh, mm, you're in the ballpark. So, 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 okay, so I'll break it down. So Alfred has a secret clearance, right? There's three levels. Remember, low, medium, high, unclassed, secret, top secret. Alfred just has a secret, right? He has a secret clearance. This is far beyond, sorry? Okay, this is far beyond his clearance level. So it was above his clearance level, it's just that simple. He just can't read things that are higher than his clearance level. However, when you go to star property, right? Alfred can write to items that are secret, that are marked secret, and he can write to items that are top secret. He can write to items that are top secret, but he can't write to items that are unclass. Why do you think he can't write to items that are unclass? Why can he write to lower security uh, items? Leaks, he might leak something from uh, top secret, secret to something below his level Correct. of certification. Yeah, so that's what happens. So what you'll have a lot of times you have a security class security classification at SCG, and it will dictate what words you say can change the classification of something, right? So imagine here's Alfred, he's in this space that he can see secret information. He's writing to an unclassified document. There's nothing classified there. And he's putting in phrases and stuff like that. Now that classification changes to the highest classification of the information that he, that he puts in there, right? So he mentions a phrase that's considered top secret. Now this unclassified or confidential document is now treated at the highest level. Now, when you dig deeper, if this particular document is on a system that's unclassified, now that entire system becomes class, uh, top, se well, top secret. Then the treatment of that system changes as well. Remember, like, in there's guidelines how these particular systems get treated, like who can touch them, do you have to have a guard? Do you have special space? Um, special space is a sensitive compartmentalized information facility or SCIF, um, DSCID, or um, there's a whole directive that deals with that. But the behavior, behaviors associated with the system change a lot. Yes. Well, why allow him to write to the top level? Oh, he can write to the top level, but he can't see anything. I mean, just why allow that? Thing? So because sometimes when you're writing in the stuff, Putting phrase together can change the classification, but he'll never know. He'll just be writing stuff, but he'll never know because he can't read it. So those items that he does, he, he can't see or, or read it. So it doesn't even matter. So sometimes, so say if you have a, a particular system, right? This system is um, top secret, right? And they're working on the program, but they don't know the system is rated higher, but maybe in that particular program, that system is treated at the mid level, right? It's medium level. So they're working on a system, but they're like, oh, technically, per the security classification guide, this needs to actually be treated as the high level. 
It gets treated at a high level, but Alfred will never be able to see that or know that. Right? He can just see things that are within his lane. All right, now we go to the last one, strong star property. So here, Alfred can only read and write to object V, right? How can it be used? Yeah, that for like guests or any, anyone who's coming in from outside the facility, they only can access whatever you at, let them access. Nothing higher, nothing lower. No, so read and write. So this is, no, well, this is just because because Alfred has a secret. So he can only make changes to the classification that he has. Right, so he can't do anything to the lower item because then he could uh, elevate the classification of that. But in terms of making changes, yeah, it's just object B because that is actually his clearance level. Because you got to remember that this model deals with confidentiality. Yes. I was going to say, isn't this really just an and of the read access he has and the write access he has? Yes. And then he can only if he can read uh the simple uh, um for read if only if he can access that and read and can access that and write he can do it and yeah because he can do he can you see they're separate they're separated he can do various things but in terms of having full read and write access it's only this object right it's just an object that you can fully read and write now for those that are going to work for this great country or your great country i don't want to discredit any other great countries or not so great countries i'm thinking about here from a dictatorship um, we were close, but, um, this particular item deals with those that are going to work in the private sector. This is the Bible security model. So here you have simple integrity condition. So subjects cannot read objects of lesser integrity, integrity star subjects cannot write to objects of higher integrity and the invocation property subject cannot send messages to the objects of higher integrity. So you'll see that this doesn't deal with confidentiality at all. Very different. Now, when you're dealing with a particular system and say you're the actual architect, you're the one who needs to figure out which particular model that you implement in your system. Now, there's a role for this, Enterprise Architect or EA. There's DODAF, Department of Defense Architecture Framework. There's TOGAF, um, the Open Group Architecture Framework. And then there's some other things, right? But though DODAF and uh, TOGAF are the big ones. And these are the people that will create these high-level models that get implemented within organizations. So choosing something like this makes it easier for actually developing the full-fledged system. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Clark Wilson is a state machine security model that addresses information flow and the integrity goals of preventing authorized subjects from modifying objects, preventing unauthorized subjects from making improper modification objects, and maintaining internal and internal consistency. What you'll see a lot here is you'll see subject, object, and all this is showing that the subject can't interact directly with the object, right? You see this a lot. Like, so say you're you're the object, right? And I'm the subject. I can't just go and shake your hand, right? There's somebody in between like, whoa, 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 calm down, buddy, calm down. Like, he's a, he's a celebrity. The, let me see your uh, VIP pass. I show my VIP pass. Maybe I get a handshake and an autograph, right? That's all that is. Think of it like that. Oh. <clears throat> Is the intermediary usually some sort of access control? Check? A program. You have like program or some type of model set up. But yes. Yeah. So it's always set up. So um, there, there's another Linux called Security Enhanced Linux, which shows a great deal of this more. But in Ubuntu, Fedora, I mean, it's in there, but um, the really strong implementation of this is Security Enhanced Linux mm -hmm. or trusted um, Solaris operating language, TESOL, but there's no money for that. But SE Linux is open sourcing, use it. <clears throat> Rule-based, kind of what I explained earlier, rule-based simply is that there's rules set forth that govern who gets access to what. Just think of that like that. Rule-based is strictly on job function. That's all that is. And so some people will have more than one job function, right? You don't want the janitor to have access to all the HR payroll stuff. That makes no sense. Like the guy is just... He's doing his job, but he doesn't need access to that. Same thing with employees. Like you don't need uh, employees being able to look at all the HR pay records of people. What do you think it happened if something like that was available? If I can say, all right, well, I'm gonna see how much money he's making. Yeah, there'll be a chaos because everyone gets to know the information that they should not know and it will a conflict of interest and everything, everyone will start asking for higher pay if the word gets out. Okay, I, asking for higher pay, I think, is a better thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 Woo, 
that's the textbook. Uh, people will start putting their resumes online. I've been in an organization where they used to actually provide the salaries uh, for jobs. And people would figure out, oh, okay, this person. Because generally what happened, they would put engineering grades. And then when they start putting the pay towards like the, like if you're engineer level three, but like step four, this is your salary range. And you're like, oh, this person's a step four because you can see now, oh, this person's making this. This person doesn't do anything. This person really comes to work. They take long lunch breaks. They have a smoke break like twice an hour. My resume is going online, right? And so that happens a lot. Like applying for jobs? Yeah, applying for jobs on the job. Mm-hmm. I've done it myself. <laughs> I applied for jobs on the job and went to a job fair on the job. <laughs> way of getting paid yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but not from the company. No, not from the company. But it, it's, it's unfortunate, but that's why you have to make sure those items are in place. And then you also don't want people taking advantage of information because there's a lot of issues internally where people will take the information, they'll sell it to competitors, or they'll take it to competitors. Uh, in Huntsville, Alabama, years ago, about a decade ago, a lot of companies would, uh, smaller companies would leave bigger companies like Northrop, Lockheed, Raytheon. So these are maybe like managers or lead engineers they would take all types of customer data and in particular products they were working on and they would spin up, spin their own company off. That's why there's so many companies down there. So people do it left and right. Well, they were. Now they're getting jailed. But <laughs> that was the big thing. They're like, okay, the customers say, yeah, we, we can't afford like $5 million like every five months. And then, you know, one of the engineers say, all right, well, I'll give it to you for half the cost. Would you would you um, hire me? And that's what people were doing left and right. So that's why you need access controls on all types of stuff. And you need to make sure that you really follow up. And if you base it on job function, that you limit to what can be done. And so we're going to go through this. All right. So there's different, a number of different items. So improve, intrusion uh, prevention system, you have intrusion detection system, IDS analysis uh, engine. So all of these are like, IPS, uh, intercepts and forwards packets, is usually a network-based device. You have IDS, you have host-based, network-based. Um, there's something we're going to um, install called Tripwire. So you can actually see an example of this. We'll install a Tripwire. And so here you can look at various packets and look at anomalies that are happening within a system or within a network. And if having something like this is great because if you have all your employees gone at the day at like 6 o'clock and all of a sudden your network tra- traffic increases, then you know someone's in your network <laughs> and someone's doing something they should be doing. So it's important to monitor what is occurring within your system. Now, later when we run SQL map and we run the um, SQL <clears throat> injection tool, when you run the tool, they will say, oh, um, this particular uh, system or network has an IDS or IPS. Up. It will say that, right? You're being blocked by this whatever cloud-based service and it'll let you know. And then, of course, you can run other attacks, what we'll talk about. But um, having something like this is it's good, right? But the key is always making sure that you are updating for latest pat- patterns and uh, signatures. All right. Sometimes that's roadmap lies. Sorry? It lies. If the um, if API has like a rate limit or something, mm-hmm. it'll say that you're being blocked by the Have you installed one or used one? Yeah. Which one? Uh, go around. Okay. I didn't know there were other ones. Yeah, I mean, there's a number of things. Um, but so I would say, so if you're running SQL map, right, and it says what's there, run SQL map, also run something to um, map out the network. And then, fi- so SQL map will say, okay, this particular IDS is being ran and this particular server, whatever, run another tool, confirm, and say, okay, now I know what's actually up here. If it states like it's um, on the networking one that will run, it'll say this particular version, Take that version, look up the vulnerabilities, look up the issues with that, and then from there, craft an attack that focuses on those vulnerabilities. All right, let's see. Okay. So, all right, so audit trail monitoring, all this is is looking at your your logs and stuff like that. That's what Tripwire would do. It's important to audit your trail so you see all activities have occurred. So here it just says audit trail, it can alert uh, security officers for suspicious activities, uh, provide details and non-conformance with legal activities, and provide information for legal proceedings. Now, in terms of provide information for legal proceedings, there's a whole chain of custody that, that occurs. 
So you take these logs. Now you have to document uh, everyone that touches these logs and make sure they're put somewhere where it doesn't get changed. You need to make a copy, get your hash. So when you go to court and you show that these are the logs from the event, they can say, okay, well, how do we know they haven't been altered? Well, you have your hash to prove that. Here's what's talking about number of issues. It just says your data volume needs to be uh, set to a clipping level um, to figure out, to filter out log events. Training, so to identify non-conformance or illegal activity. So training is a big thing, right? So if you look, even with this institution, we get the SANS training. So the training is, it's there's a lot of click, I could click and run training, right? It's just cookie cutter training. Um, you know, you're looking out for this type of uh, phishing attack and stuff like that. With a lot of AI tools, and I mentioned this, that is easy to customize attacks and stuff like that now. Like before, oh, it's, it's not how we spell this. This is British English. This is not someone locally. But now with a number of things, including your social media, they can truly create attacks that um, can really get through quite easy. But the training is, is a big thing because everybody um, is going to, well, people are, how do I say this? Figure out what's the most common attack in your organization. And then from there, put out training that works with that, right? Don't just be like, okay, there's there's viruses out there. You send out training for viruses, but that is not the biggest um, item being exploited or occurring that in your organization. It's something else. Uh, store and archive, basically you need, access, need access control to audit logs and secure uh, storage for archive. Depending upon the environment, and what um, directory directives, uh, mandates, and policies, they will literally drive how long you get to store these particular logs. If you're dealing federal government, three to five years, right? It will dictate how it gets stored, where it gets stored, and then it will need to be someone who's um, certified for actually managing that particular data. And then when it's time to destroy them, then that is yet another process. All right, so here's talk about security audit. <clears throat> so here it just says, this is to verify meeting of defined and specified security requirements. So certification creation is a long process. That's gonna be about two years, year to two years on large systems. And what you'll do is, is just think about the system development lifecycle and you're going through the process, adding in security edit, but you get to a point where you have requirements that are embedded. You have an internal team that tests these requirements and then a third party assessor that comes in and they are testing those requirements and the other ones are going to issue you your approval to operate or give you your particular um, uh, accreditation. Say, all right, you can operate the system. Once you get that generally, every year you have to go back. And then um, you always have to still continuously monitor your system, any updates you have to put out. And if there's something that you're deficient on, you have to state how you will actually meet that. That is called a poem, plan of actions and milestones. And you will state these are the resources, this is the cost. This is going to be the touch point or the actual individual that's going to be working in this particular matter. And there's two different approvals. There's a full approval to operate. There's an interim approval where you have your POEM that you have to meet these particular items and say, hey, you have an IETO. It's going to work for six months. You'll come back. We'll do the test again, and we'll see if you actually met the things you said you were going to do. All right. And then here, just talking about the um, security vulnerability assessment evaluation. Uh, used in the risk assessment and evaluation process. And then here it says vulnerability assessment produces a profile of security posture. So the cyber posture or the information posture of the system. These are different assessments. So there's red teams, there's blue teams. Um, those are the ones that are commonly known, but there's also purple, purple teams, which is a combination of blue and red teams. This helps you understand your environment more. All right, that's what it does. Helps you start standing your environment more. Now, does it cost? If you're doing it internally, but a lot of times organizations will have to go externally to hire these professionals. Now, there's a couple of certs that will help you. Um, there's a certified ethical hacker. Um, there's the licensed penetration tester. Those are from EC Council, and there's some other certs out there. But in terms of the amount of jobs that are out there for um, people doing this, it's not as many as one would hope. So that's the thing as well. So go to that cyberseek.org. Think about the job you want to do. See if there's a lot of jobs out there for what you want to do. And then move forward. But I will tell you, I know a company here in Chicago, 
um, their interview, their first part of the interview process is to actually break into uh, a system of theirs on a network. You break into that, you do a second interview, and their starting salary is around 130. It's good money. And you don't need you don't need to be a US citizen for the job neither. Yeah, they're a company based at the UK. Their North American headquarters, I think, is here in Chicago, but they have uh, opportunities everywhere, everywhere. And they're a third party assessor. So companies will say, hey, you know, we need you to test our networks. OK, they go in, they test the network, they provide a report, and then that's it. All right. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to pause this and then we are going to go through and let me pause. So if you need to share your screen, then you can just share your screen. Uh, say you're like, yo, I uh, have a, have an issue with trying to make this script run. Okay, share your screen. Um, we'll go through it. I'll share my screen and then I'll go through it as well. And then we'll we'll get it up and running. All right, so just now we're getting now to assignments. Sorry? Yeah. Are you on Zoom? No, I was Oh, it's on here. No, I'm saying like, say if you do office hours, I generally send a Google Meet. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I mean, you can say, hey, I have an issue, but I can't see your issue. Because a lot of times there will be other things like maybe dependencies missing from your system and we may need to actually fix your operating system. Like for example, I have something missing in my system. So my virtual machine isn't working. <laughs> so I will fix that over this week. And I know exactly what's wrong, but I'll fix it over the week and get it uh, working. But you may have something similar, especially when we uh, run some of these other programs. All right, so let me. All right, I'm going to have it here. So I'm just going to see the desktop. Plus the, I'm actually going to make directory. All right, so now I'm in this particular directory I just created. And so the instructions say, choose a routine task that can be automated using a shell script, backup, log rotation, file synchronization, write a script that automates this task, right? Script two is system status. And basically this is a uh, script to get the status of the system. This one seems pretty easy. So we're just gonna go here and I'm going to create a script so the create touch status.sh. So now I have the status created. If I do ls dash L, it's going to let me know what I can do with that script, right? So you see right here, read, write, no execute, read, write, no execute. So users, groups, others. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ch mld plus x status. Going to check it, and you can see that now status is executable. Now, you can use Nano or Vim. Again, I mentioned that Vim is like a favorite of mine. So I will do sudo apt install Vim. All right, so Vim is there. I will type in Vim status. Okay, I spelled status wrong. Never sells English major. Okay. So on the first line, yep. Bang, bin bash. <clears throat> Name. Oh, Dawson. And now I can work on the actual script. So it says here design a script that gathers and displays information, system information like CPU usage memory usage, disk space, and network statistics, right? So now I think about the commands that would provide that to me. You got top, okay. So we got top. What? NAT? All right, and that's that. Echo, 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 echo is a... Uh, echo is like for... Say, um, having to screen like uh, output information. DF, 
All right. What else we got? You name, we'll just you, you name dash. Okay, DF. You name dash A. Got something else? What is it? Got BM set. All right, so we are going to exit up this. Oh. IP show. All right, so let's do this. All right, so escape into the colon. WQ is right quit. I'm going to enter. I'm going to clear this. And now I'm going to run this. So period for slash status. It runs. But the problem with top, it just, everything comes here. All right, and so these items came. So no, I have show, no, I have config. So was this useful? Kind of. Okay. Okay. Let's let's go back in. Yeah, it's a, it's a working process. So now it's like so that didn't work. So now there was a mention of echo. So insert echo. Should probably divide us up a bit. All right, so now I'm gonna create this little lovely line. Oh, good lord. And then rather than running this every time, I should be able to throw this in a text file. So now I wanna really, I wanna write this into a text file. How do I write this into a text file? Huh? Is it touch? No. Use a pipe sign. Okay. So uh, the pipe, and like this pipe, yeah, the, like the two pipes, no, the one pipe. Yeah. Okay, the carrot. Okay. Oh, yeah, sorry. That's okay. That's good. Carrot pipes. They're all the same. Ah. Uh, so what you'll need to do is so this one carrot will create, and then two carrots will append right so once you use it the first time then the second time is two carrots and you can append so this will take all the output and place into the file okay okay what would you grab yeah oh that's for creating a file Right, so grab you'll use it to find files, but you you want to create like you want to have all this output placed somewhere. That's what you want. Yeah, and then you'll like to make it nice. You'll have uh, comments. You'll throw comments in there. Um, let me show that. Right, so you'll see that it looks very different. All right, so that then top we'll probably change that, but you name like here. And let's see what we do this. System. So now I'm just trying to put in a number of different items. Let's see. My next administrator ends. All right. Should have put my thing up here. All right. So all I'm doing now is I'm just trying to make sure that, 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 that. You don't want top, but you do want. What?
So sometimes you got to run the command individually, see if it's going to be installed. If I was writing a type of script, I would actually run to install the command and then run the command afterwards because you don't know if the command is actually going to be there. All right. Okay. So that works. So now we know I have config works. I just go in here. Uh, slide IP. So the reason you write comments, the same as your coding. If you take it in a coding class, you'll understand that comments are needed because someone else will take the script and they will need to run the script as well. So rather than having someone try to figure out, okay, well, why, why is the script doing X, Y, and Z? They can just go through here and say, oh, now I know why this is going here because it's getting this particular type of information. All right, so now I'm going to run it here. We have calendar, date, your name, dash A, BF, plus uh, BLK. All right, cool. So I'm just going to add some other items. Let's BLK. And there is an echo you can do, and this creates a blank space. Just going to copy this. Actually, let me do something else. So, echo is to C, system status, going to write to a file. That is not to this. At it, it's that txt. So, Dr. Mo, for our assignment, you really prefer that we kind of go step by step and explain what we're doing. As yes, we're... it's going to be a, you're going to create a very you're going to create very detailed scripts. And so here I'm just giving an example. Actually, I'm just copy this. Yeah, like here, just showing very detailed examples. Ah, uh, going to go here. Make this bigger. Make this bigger. All right, perfect. That might be too big, but yeah, th this is what you're doing, right? So the top. Really insert unless I type something fat fingered. Is there? Okay. That back there. All right, so what I'm doing now is I'm just gonna write this to this particular program here. The one thing I hate about this is like, if you click outside of it, it doesn't work as well. So the one question, so for, for the top command, we could use n-1, so it only shows one iteration. Is it in dash one? Yeah. What do you mean? So with the top command, we could use n space dash one. So it, it only shows one iteration of all the CPUs. Oh, yes. Yeah. So yeah, I'm sorry. You could do that. And you could break it out. So the purpose of doing it like this is so it, it's breaking everything out. Making it so difficult to see. See if it's difficult like this. Just moving this real quick to see what's going on. So we just copy this. I'm going to copy this and I'm going to bring it right back over. And so that is .txt. So let's see this. All right, so just copy and paste real quick. All right, awesome. Okay, it's going through. All right, so I'm just going to go through, create the other carrot. Carrot. Okay. 
So it does take some time to get it the way that you want it to look. But I'm going to give an example so you can see it before it's time. That is that is uh, txt. Same thing here. That is the txt. Okay. Now I'm just going to add in a bunch of. Well, let me just run it so you can just see an example. This example. Bless you. Yeah. All right. So that one's there. I'm going to clear. Sorry. Clear. Going to run this item again. Bless you. Cat cat Nate status that txt. So I'm looking in the file and aha, top is the reason. But you can see this is what it wrote into the file. So I go back into them. I can go here and I can make necessary changes. So obviously, this create an issue. Escape before I quit. Run it again. So clear. I can catenate status that takes D. Oh, nothing pulled up. Okay, let me see what I did wrong. Let's see. All right, so it shows here. I'm gonna actually click in a file real quick and see what happened. Desktop IT new. All right, so you can always check inside. I'm like, okay, well, why did it not work? I'll see like what changes need to be made to see why it didn't work. All right, so let me close this. And that is that TST. See something real quick. What I'm going to see is which particular items will run and not run because it should have all created in here. All right, now I see why. So netstat does run. And so sometimes the problem can be it all not running into the script. So here's netstat running. Here's, here's df running. Here is f shell. Yep. Last well, BLK. That works. All right, so if I go back in here, make some changes, and I can um, just comment out things that, like, okay, let me figure out what is not working, right? So, insert, comment this item out, can escape, right quit again, run this. 
it runs. So that's all right. So now ls hat. And I can go into the file and see what ran. Right. And generally you don't want to just comment things out as dead code. You want to have that item removed because it could cause issues later on. Code or script. But you can see this is what was creating the file. Right. Now if I go back into them. I can, yeah, just go back into them and see what's there. Right. So, yeah, this is just an example. Um, again, the code can be much more elegant, but for the purpose of time, it's up, it's running. But you will make yours elegant. <laughs> and if you want to share your screen while I'm here, you can do that. So you can share your screen. We can go through and see what you're doing, and then we can talk about it further. So I'm gonna stop my share and I'm gonna allow you to share your screen if you want. And you can, yeah, you can share your screen. Yes. Uh, so some of, the, uh, some of the commands um, uh, you use, they're not installed initially on some, on some machines. Uh, is it okay if you have like the command uh, sudo app install? Yeah, you can install like three, four programs in one line. So you can do a sudo app install, put those programs in there. It, all, it looks like they're all under just net tools. So, yeah. So what you can do is, so initially when you start, you can have the sudo app net tools, and then you can have the output put in a, a particular, uh, in the file, and then just create, like, this is the install of these tools, the results. Yeah. Because what a lot of people don't realize, when Linux starts up, you are able to see everything that's running and not working and stuff. Especially with Ubuntu, it'll come up and say, oh, this is working, this is working, running this, this is not working. And this is one of the key things I say about running these particular scripts and capturing the data. You can see if something fails or there's a dependency needed and stuff like that. Yes. Sorry? I would say the easiest would be to create a folder and then write the scripts in that folder. And then when you upload your file, you can just upload that entire folder with your three scripts or just upload them. But when you execute something like when I did the period forward slash, you're running that in that directory. So you need to be in that directory to execute it. And then that gets us to another one. Let me go back here to assignments. Where you need to have a software installer, right? Software installer, I think it's fairly, I think it's easy. But I will write a software installer real quick. So let's see. Uh, let's see, sudo modify. Again, you can share your screen if you want to. What I'm going to do for those that are watching, I'm going to share. Let me, let me see. I'm going to do this. So we are going to do. All right. So you'll be able to see on the, the YouTube video what I'm sharing. But basically what I'm looking, what I'm doing now is I'm writing a quick install file. And I'm just creating a quick install file. And actually... Should probably remove the one I created. All right, cool. So I'm just creating a quick install. Sh. 
T H L D seven seven seven. Sorry, seven seven seven. Vim install. So I'm just creating an example of a install script that you can see. I'll actually load these scripts up as well. So I'll load this up, these scripts, so you can actually have access to them. Our base. So install. Apt install Wireshark. Nothing weathered. Okay, that actually works. Okay. All right, so all I'm doing now is just writing a quick install script. You'll be able to see. All right, so like I said, I'm going through right now. I'm, I'm writing something so you can just see how it looks just a little bit better.
All right, I'm going to be ready to show you this in a little bit. All right, cool things. Okay. All right, so this is the one I just created. So let me just make this larger. All right. So clear. Do ls. Concatenate the install. So that's the script right here. So this is what I just wrote in you know, five minutes or whatever. I'm going to sudo sh install. Have it run. Let's see what comes out. All right, so it ran. I'm gonna see what file is here. Obviously, it's this one. I'm gonna concatenate the install.txt, and now you'll see that everything here is captured. Has the dates. These are the updates. And Wireshark and uh, Rbase is already there. But that's all it is, right? Again, it's five minutes. It's not pretty. If I had more time, I would make it all nice. I have comments, reason why I'm doing this, have real page breaks. But that's why I say these assignments, they look difficult. But in reality, grab your second monitor, watch a show on Netflix. I, rec I uh, recommend uh, K-Drama Mask Girl. It's really good. Um <laughs> And again, you can see exactly what I did. It was nothing special. Actually, concatenate install that. Yep, and that's all I wrote. So again, nothing complicated. And I did this in five minutes, if it was five minutes, right when you guys are just working back here. That's all I did. No, it'd be a uh, right. so date. I echoed something. If I wanted to create a blank line, if you want to create a blank line, just echo quotation marks, single or double quotes, it'll create a blank line. So you create page breaks in the actual text file. <clears throat> and then I just say what I want to install. Again, I have a lot of these programs installed. Yes. You can do HTML. So if you just echo it, what happens is that you don't, it doesn't, the data doesn't be out, it won't be output anywhere. It's important to keep like the results of these things. Yeah, you do. I mean, I just, I thought it was just but like the status like the thing that I'm but you were you were blessed with these fingers. But then I can, okay, so then I can run through you could and type it out to a file if I wanted it in a file. You could also put the command to like make it automatically enter the file. Well, yeah, but that's. I mean, so say you're you're the, you're the you're the guy in charge. You're the system admin, right? So maybe you're, you're the person in charge, right? You're the system admin. And so you want to have a record of everything that you do, right? You don't want to be writing the file every single time, but ah, what was the output? If you can have it dubbed into a file with a date and stuff like that, then it's perfect. Then you have your records. You have your records already created. You grab that file, you analyze it. Okay, this worked, this worked. Oh, I, this, this particular program already had these items installed. You see, it comes back, well, not here, but it comes back with an error. It says it's already installed. Now you can say, oh, well, I have a baseline image for these systems. But obviously, there's a discrepancy because these systems already have this particular application installed. And then later, you can um, use program to look at the differences between the text files to see what's installed and what's not. And you can query that. Again, remember, look, you make your job easy, right? You do your work up front. 
And then after that, it's just, it's just coasting. Or do you want to work hard every time? You work hard one time. That's it. After that, it's just, you're just coasting. The cool thing is with this, once you have this built out, you can reuse it for other stuff. You have your template. Now you just go in there. All right, I need to add this, add this, add this in here. I already have my breaks in here. I know the file is going to create. Maybe I change the name of the file. Then you just you just reuse it. Like you should have a, 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 a I guess you could say a bag of your code and scripts that you can use in the future. You should keep that, right? You shouldn't always be starting from scratch. You already written something that's really good. Reuse it. There's something called code reuse. Same thing for scripting. Code reuse. Reuse what you have, right? It makes you more efficient. Don't start from scratch all the time. Again, you do work hard that first time. After that, a lot of it should be reused. I've right, got like five minutes left. Any questions? Any suggestions for uh, what's the simplest uh, we should focus on for the other two parts of the assignment? Sure. Let me uh, pull it up. Yeah, Talking about software installer, that's what that is. Yeah, so this is software installer here. So like Wireshark, um, Nmap, that's what that is. And so what I did here, like, if I wanted to get um, all the, okay, so I broke this out. You can actually install three, four programs in a line. But to make the text file look more um, readable, I installed one item, and then I had that, I put that information output, redirected that output to a file. Then I had a break and I say, hey, this item is installing and do the same thing. Because if two programs are inst installed without the four programs I'm trying to install, it will it will be difficult to read through it. I just make it read easier. Like, okay, this program's here, boom, this is the output, this is the output. But, but you want us to install just one part, right? Uh, one uh, software? That's I mean, it's like the bare minimum. You can do more than one. The Netflix, like, I work for like, like, as an example of one of the things yeah. I install. Yeah. And as like a follow up, would it be possible to link the two files together? Like, for example, if you try running the status, it'll run the install as well. Um, you can, you can do a, you can do a copy paste. This is again, net tool to run in there as well. Um, in a real world, what you would do is you would be the one to set up the entire file, like what needs to run, what needs to install, and everything. It would be, it would be your master file for hardening. Right. So you would have your file that runs like you would build your image and then in the image when you're installing, you have that automatically run. Yeah, yeah you just build that element. Yes. In the back. Yeah. On the what? Um, You can automate like removals of stuff. Um, Here it says log rotation. So you can do stuff with your logs or backups. Yeah, like one of the easiest thing I tell people to do, especially if you're not very familiar with the Linux commands, look up like you can look up basic Linux commands, right? They'll come up. Then look up commands that system administrators need to know. Those will come up like all the commands to see system status, you know, stuff like that. And then from there, you can use that like LM sensors, right? Has anybody heard of LM sensors or sensors? It tells you like uh, how your the the temp of your P, uh, pc let me see oh. yeah so here i have sensors running showing sensors and that's that's all it is but it's important to know all right i'm gonna stop the share and stop the recording